So hello, everyone. I'm Judith Panera. I'm the Executive Director of AMC and AMC Foundation. It is a pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual discussion. We hope that you and our community of colleagues, allies, and supporters around the globe are healthy and safe. Thank you to our attendees for making space in their schedule to join us, and we give gratitude to our speaker, Shaheen, and to our partner in this program, OAG, especially to Zainab for reaching out to start a conversation about it. We are grateful. The AMC Foundation offices are in Manhattan and New York City, and today I'm speaking to you from Brooklyn, locations situated upon the unceded, seized territory of the Lenape and Canarsi peoples and benefited from the economies of slavery and the labors of African descended captives. We owe our existence and vitality to generations from around the world who are brought here against their will, drawn here to escape persecution, and some that have lived on this land for more generations and can be counted. We pay respect to their communities past and present. This acknowledgement, take, this acknowledgement asks us each to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration and settlement that brings us here today. AMC is dedicated to an environment in which all individuals are treated with respect and dignity at our programs. Each individual has the right to be in a professional atmosphere that prohibits discriminatory practices, including harassment. Our full code of conduct policy for all our programs, as well as the outlets to make a direct or an anonymous report of a violation has been posted in the chat feature. With a network spanning the globe, AMC is the leader for art curators at every stage of their career and the leading champion of their significant contributions. Our commitment to having open dialogues on critical issues of advocacy and, conclusion, and inclusion and to advancing innovative, collaborative, and empathetic environments. Throughout 2020, we have responded swiftly with purpose to serve our community. This year alone, we will have welcomed over 8,000 individuals to over 100 programs. All our past webinars and conference sessions are freely available on our YouTube channel. Thank you again to our audience, Shaheen, and to our friends and collaborators at OAG. Zainab, I hand it to you. Thanks, Judith, um, very much. I'm Zainab Burji, Executive Director of the Ontario Association of Art Galleries, commonly known as OAG. It is a pleasure to welcome you all today. And, and as Judith said, um, we hope that you and your colleagues are safe and well. I respectfully acknowledge that OAG carries out its work on the lands which is located on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg and the Huron-Wendat. We offer gratitude to the First Peoples for their care, for for their care and for their teachings about our earth and our relations. And may we honor those teachings. This year at OAG, we mark our 50th anniversary and we largely serve the visual arts sector, uh, including public art galleries and art museums in Canada. We know that with the COVID-19 pandemic, three crises have been highlighted, health, social and economic. And in the face of these crises, I think visual arts institutions are faced with even greater precarity than before. And there's uncertainty, but also reflection. Now we're delighted to work with our partners, the AAMC. I met Judith at the New, at the New York conference last year, organized by them. And we had decided then to find opportunities to work together. And what better than coming together in these times of crises to collectively think and reflect on our present and future. Now, since our telematic embrace, courtesy of Zoom, has become part of our reality, let me just share some housekeeping notes. After our keynote address by Shaheen, we will have a 10 to 15 minutes Q&A session. These Q&As will be moderated by Judith and myself. And if you do have any questions, please can you post them in the chat with a, with a cue before it so that we know that you have a question. Once we've finished our Q&A, we will go into the breakout rooms. And Shaheen, oh, um, and in the breakout rooms, Shaheen will go from one to the other and visiting each one. Also, um, at the end of the presentation or the keynote, Shaheen will be leaving us with some takeaways. 
and we will have an opportunity to carry them into our breakout rooms and we shall put them in the chat box or you may also take a screenshot, whichever is easier or convenient for you. Once we finish in the breakout sessions, uh, we'll come back to the main zone for our closing remarks and any last thoughts or reflections. Now that I've finished the housekeeping, let us welcome Shaheen Morali, curator and critic. I've known Shaheen for decades and as an integral part of the British Black Art Movement and followed his work and have been very impressed by his thought process and ability to look beyond the obvious. Shaheen, I hand it over to you. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like also to thank the Ontario Association of Art Galleries and the Association of Art Museum Curators and Foundation for the invitation to give this keynote address. I'm grateful to Zainab Virji for her constant support, Judith Pinheiro, who I've just recently met, and the colleagues who have been very helpful to this presentation, Monica Valenzuela, Gorima Garcia, and Jessica Lucas. I must also thank Narinda Pashkede and Pamela Merali for their personal understanding on this material. I welcome you here, uh, especially with the amount of amazing encounters which are now available online. Thank you for joining us on this overview of my curatorial practice. It remains incredibly important for us to be able to make the effort to be together whenever and however possible. This is a time of a global crisis, one within which we seem to be sharing a great amount of information and time to manage our consciousness. We're in the middle of our future. Such gatherings as these become a place in which we discuss terms of adaption or adaptation, associations, and fabricate our responses to ourselves, our families, and the community. I'm coming to the belief that these possibilities provide the structure and the reinvention necessary to engage in our ability to mediate the historical divisions and to contribute more holistically. Recently, the militant Greek philosopher Panagiotis Sotiris wrote in his paper, thinking beyond the lockdown of the possibility of a democratic biopolitics from which I've taken the following quote. I remain curious about the terms that he associates with this emergency because to a large extent, for the first time in our generation, we are collectively facing such volatility, one that is without invitation, involving no convention. We are all sharing our lives in a strange company. It is and remains our present. Central to this unprecedented segregation are its remnants, some of which might be the ground in which we are reborn or work that is necessary to resettle the distance we inhabit to our planet. Although the planet is suffering, it is uneven and in certain parts, the intensification and periods vary. I would like to add the caveat, the notion of reborn, which I've used as part of my title, should be seen outside of its strictly religious connotations and more in line with the return to certain passages in our understanding of the forces that we need to expand and extend so we are able to share the planet and its resources more consciously outside of the imperial framework that has made lives lived inhospitable and understood state terror. The terms that Panagiotis Sotiris highlights, resistance, struggle and transformation, have played a key role in my own life since the beginning of my practice as an artist. I have viewed my work as a form of resistance a struggle with complex, complex intricacies and the role of poetics to transform by entering the subject. As such, the place in the arts, or my place in the arts, has been a ground that allowed closer contact with the community in a relationship as an educationalist to open up debates about the canon and the mythical nature of its modernity, and later on, the relationship to curating and writing. 
it deepen, deepened my relationship to material objects, temporal, uh, temporal effects in exhibition making, and the politicization of the ocular and of narratives. It has become even more important than ever before to touch the feelings and to move on to the emotions as we propose reclamation, restitution, and the continuous potential in excavating and reinstating. Recently, artists, including in this slide, Fiona Banner, have had to solely depend on online facilities to dis disseminate their work. So much has become part of the provocations with talks about crisis, change, COVID, post-COVID, and quite a lot of these three notions, remnants, reborn, resettled, have been highlighted in the emerging vectors of possibly including and of resistance, struggle and transformation. In many ways, we are all in principle struggling to locate a new universal where we are capable, where we are capable of being included or expressing ourselves without the restrictions of the past. It's fake histories and the delusions around race, meaning and in what can only be described often as deceptive limits of the imagination. And as it has been suggested, this new universal is our move towards a pluriversal in which the world is conceived according to the theory or theories of pluralism. Here in this moment, we are tiptoeing around each other. My intention in this conversation is to reevaluate with you the place that trust and its remnants have played in the production of resistance, struggle and transformation. This will be in the form of a red text in the first part, which is followed by examples from my co a collection uh, or an archive called Panchayat, which I set up with other artists in London. And in the final part of the presentation, I will examine the individual and collaborative counterpoints brought to the public sphere to present epistemic diversity and embedded knowledge. Of course, as, as uh, Zainab has pointed out, we will follow up on these three areas in the QA, Q and A, as well as in the rooms which we will be uh, inhabiting. The first part, remnants. Remnants, or the notion of remnants, is partly based on re-examining, which has become the which has become the taking into account of how re how we relate both to the pandemic and what remains to the aspects of that which was prior to the pandemic. Are we relating to the economic and climate crises in the same way? A lot of people have argued otherwise, that we've forgotten some of those struggles. Are we beginning to share a sense of kinship that is allowing us to share rather than own? These are all parts of the remnants which I will argue about or think through with you. We have to remember that it is our biosphere that has affect and detect our lives, our work and our relation to just about everything and everybody. Nothing, it seems, remains untouched. Our formal needs and lives had intensified the destruction of our planet. Its historical extraction via colonialism, casteism, and the Atlantic slave trade have all made us live in the debt. The roots of the imperial framework have remained a mode of being and living that has produced the current crisis. In this remnants, which includes capitalism and its log algorithms, which are threatening within its inequality. Now more than ever, our current understanding has become part of the border that the public philosopher Achille Mbebe calls the necropolitics, where social atomization, that means food crisis, the water crisis, the refugee crisis, the economic migration, and the world remains in a constant battle. We need to understand the complex intricacies and networks and the roles to facilitate change. The radical loss are the fragments of differences we carry as partial knowledge of our place in defining and maintaining the remaining borders. We are the guardians in the use of certain protocols, ethics and codifications that inhibit the possibilities of democratic values. Some of these fundamentals are corroding it has taken leadership, re-governance and civic courage, the ethos of which still remains under threat from the latent displeasure of those who seek to gain from late capitalism. 
The fear mongering and bigotry that views a necessary breakdown is reasserting, reasserting its dominance, critiquing reason, playing on our fears and exploiting the temporalities that maintain the lockdowns. We have been made to contemplate the plague, a place of human contrivance. The history of greed and what is certainly a plethora of institutions remain part of our lives have institutionalized culture, healthcare, and the place of art. And even the art world remains incomplete in the breakdown of trust, which we are all going through. So here, I, I must clarify just slightly here that what I mean by that is that there are certain things that have to be made much more tangible. Possibly, I, I suggest one of the main points in this is that we need to look back to a certain extent at this particular point to understand where we are now, but also what is it that we have been able to do and what, has, what have we been doing collectively as an us? This remains a foundational necessity if we are to steer towards a transparent continuity, not a tokenism, neither should we understand what is possible by not looking at what we can integrate from the work which has already taken place. What have we learned from our previous circumstances? What have we learned from our previous policies? Or what needs to be, to be part of the unfolding futures? And it's not a future, it's futures. Many contemporary curators and writers shared a standalone history as part of their career. As independent curators, one often touches various issues with different institutions simultaneously. So in many ways, they experience an overview rarely available for those who work within one institution. Similarly, artists have myriad perspectives of the art world, invested in self-survival and always incorporating the intuitive knowledge and apply it to the nomadic psychiatry. Artists are often the visitors and never owners of institutions. Their place in institution is polyphonic, unusually plural rather than dual. This is important an important lesson from the past which we need to take forward because they offer a unique way to interpret existing frameworks of museums and institutions to even assist in breaking their prejudices and sometimes make new ones unfortunately and the final point in looking and locating from the past to the future is for the general public museums have been one of the most trusted public institutions for many they have been a site of consciousness building and curatorial, curatorial practice has been often judged on their relationship to subject matter that has been overlooked, misunderstood, or marginalized in the public domain. This remains a key to motion social change for future public institutional context. We need to keep that space safe to allow further consciousness building through curatorial policy and, and projects. If we are to remain and can remain conduits for exchange, and if we are to maintain a perpetual movement from westernized and metapatriarchal modernities, we need to forge a path that reclaims that vision to create counterflowing images and movements. In many ways, we also have to understand that modernity has been complicit with global reform. It has been inextricably linked to local and national governments and governance and to corporations, evident and in plain, plain sight in many of our urban institutions and increasingly in all our lives. If we take the instance of those audiences who attend in the thousands of various biennales and curated experiences such as Documenta and even art fairs, let's say the Indian art fair, they come away with a reflective tension a dissonance that arises from that external stimuli. For them, exhibitions and events becomes a place to extend their knowledge or even an understanding. Trusting in attending museums, biennales and certain art fairs makes living itself less provisional for those of us who have ended up living in fictitious time. So we need to draw upon and start acknowledging the fact then we need to de debate the sterility that remains in many institutions, their position taking. Public spaces where black, brown and persons of color and indigenous communities in the global north 
were never seen as important, nor was the quest of the institution to centrally broaden, broaden their metropolitan margins. Even in the advent of alternative spaces for the alternative set of perspectives that came in the aftermath of the abolition of slavery, the receding power of the British Empire, the genocide in Europe and North America, the uncertainties of belonging is rendered in separation. It takes trust from all sides to overcome the differences in class, race, caste, and even age. For living artists in the new millennium, one great takeaway has been the, their experiences in ne negotiating with inter interlocutors, including curators, and sometimes even directly being able to work with museum administration or even art institution bodies. This has been partly due to the need to supply an exponential growth in programs, ambition displays of art, and within, within and in public, to, which have been obliged, to have obliged that they made a force to diversify their collection, policies, workshops, postgraduate programs. Until 2020, before COVID to a certain extent, Employment in the visual culture sector seemed to be getting slightly better every season. Mainly, I would suggest, due to the courage of those who demand their civil rights to be included in the new millennium. It would be shameful to think that the plethora of international opportunities, including Biennales, will wilt in this predicament, or to return possibly as bottlenecks and portals of MRO codes. The incomprehensive rate of disarray marks this pandemic. The increasing fragility and the institutional ability to react quickly or wisely has been noted by many and will of course affect the valency of curatorial relationship. What is beginning to emerge is a breakdown, circuit breaking within the systems of governance. Many have, have shown suspicion of the institutional power of our art what sort of art and the art worker and the institutional management has been seen or noted down as failing for artists and his collectives. I believe on many fronts, curators have remained part of the silent class, still in hope to retain their middle person status. We are at a point where we can carry on building on new multiple relationships between many different players. We have to express the failure that is coming through in the way that certain art workers and art artists even have been treated throughout this predicament. The nature of art institutions from, let's say, from predominantly monocultural board memberships to the way institution, institutions have quickly morphed into global, global art complexes, and is a term coined by Amelia Jones. According to Jones, these art, com art complexes perpetuate the, to to the toxicity, toxicity, toxicity of a near liberal glamour. I always falter when, I, when I'm quoting somebody else. The recent pandemic crisis has placed art institutions and its complexes in a transition mode. Their sliding grasp of its survival has failed to reconsider the effects of their economic decisions. What has followed in their revisions of budgets and contracts has already placed the art worker in an unprecedented precarious status. For instance, many artists and union members have, have to a large extent um, been affected by redundancies. Can we actually go back to the last slide? Yeah. So for many artists and your members, the proposed redundancies include uh, the 313 staff members at the Tate Enterprise who were art workers in publishing in their shops and the cafes and restaurants in their branches in London, Liverpool and St. Ives. These were brutal cuts which were made and a lot of people felt that part of the problem has become the way that we have not been, have been not reminded ourselves of what institutional powers can do. We must also remind ourselves that curatorship itself 
is not beyond the critique offered by other parties, such as art workers uh, employed by institutions and other workers employed by institutions. In many ways, what we need to suggest, uh, what has been suggested by Arjun Apadarai, is that we need to turn to our capacity to imagine a much more moral archive, a much more moral way of working, including the historical violence which is present in Western culture, in collections, and in the way that the, the institutions themselves were formed. I would suggest that alignment closely follows the trajectory, the trajectory what Achil Mbebe has suggested of the necropolitics, which is about concerning the politics of life and the use of social and political power to dictate how some people live or may live, and to a certain extent, how some must die and also cultures die. So we have to be very careful in terms of how we treat each other at this particular point, because it's also about the treatment of cultures and what we have received and carry on reenacting upon. Next slide, please. Now, the idea of going back in time to look at what one has done, for me, has remained an important part of the way that I approach my own collaborative mannerisms, or how I have turned to understand the place of people who shared their time in an attempt to disband unequal and oppressive narratives. What remains now of that particular period of time are the archives, sometimes private, sometimes artists, artists who collected materials for their studio practice, which then in turn become archives. One such archive is the one that I started with a group of people, including in 1988, this is, uh, including Alan de Souza. Um, and in consultation with meetings with other three artists. Uh, Panchayat was as then known as Panchayat Arts Education Resource Unit was founded and was placed in Hoxton, East London. What happened was immediately we found ourselves working within youth and community centers. We were turned away from the art world as such and we found ourselves working in, in, in a different sense with another set of art worlds which operated in another space. So we have to also be aware of what happens when the art world creates a parallel economy which one has to access. And many, many people of color as such as black and brown artists ended up or what were known as ethnic minority artists turned to such, space, such spaces as community centers, youth centers, to reimagine what the arts could be, what the theater could be, what workshops could be, how could one experiment with techniques such as photographic, drawing. Drawing itself became about self-portraiture, the idea of turning on oneself and the self in a divisive society. In many ways, there were different ways, different ways to look at subjectivity, and the subject. I remember instances in which there were many gathering, gatherings, public forums, including plays by organizations like Tara Arts or openings at the Black Art Gallery and Horizons Gallery and launches, book launches at New Beacon Books. All of these spaces became equally important at this point for all types of different artists and creative within the creative sector. In a sense, a different model emerged from community-based work. It provided a comprehensive con configuration and it accommodated our perspectives of the 1980s and it's also shaped the ways in which we recognize the crossover between artistic community, community development and community education. In a sense, it provided what became known as identity politics or culture, cultural identity. In many ways, as so many people have already pointed out, a lot of the work which was done in the 80s and in the 90s has been lost to us now. We, need to be, we, need, we seem to be revisiting very similar issues in this uh, particular time. I would also suggest to a certain extent, what happened 
um, to Panchayat was also what is happening in very, very, very close to what is happening now, that the community was under attack and it made a great deal of material unsettled, including our, the, the very idea of home, of being at home, of being in, 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 in a place which one could call home. Panchayat was set up um, very near to Brick Lane. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Brick Lane was a predominantly Bangladeshi area, full of curries, curry houses. It was known as a curry mile. It became very famous. It was not only the center and the location of the Bangladeshi community with its multiple restaurants, but it attracted a lot of interest in what was going on around eating and around being the social identity of the area. In many, way, in, in, in many instances, Panchayat was located for the first time we felt our gut instinct was it was located in the right area at the right time. Panchayat by itself, uh, sort of historically, is a Gandhian concept, principle, meaning a village council. And it being placed in this historic quarter of London with a very heteropatriarchal resonances and the place of both very old yet terrified South Asian presence, um, made it and remained, it made it sort of mobile, made it even nominal, just like the community. It was part of the occupation of vacant spaces. And Punjab became very much, very, very much a, a space within which one could travel or find itself in different locations. And Panchayat occupied spaces for six months at a time, had to move on. This process of relocation of the archive closely mirrored the local community, which had remained tenanted. It lived, precarious, it lived, lived in, the, in the shadow of landlords' decisions. And the inner city areas like, uh, like uh, Hoxton and, and the Spitterfields and Brick Lane were very similar to Leicester, Bradford, Birmingham, where potential crisis or violent clashes remain imminent. In many ways, um, what, I like, what I'm trying to get at here is that Panchayat was a proposal to provide, to, to try and locate the place of bias and the systemic control that, in a sense, controlled access and traction. If we were to realize or have a better understanding of the historical and contemporary and its relevance in curating, we have to somehow align our activities. And, in, and apart from remaining in conversation with artists and artist-led network, it's incredibly useful to collect material in certain places, which at times remain outside of perceived national cultures, or in this case, perceived British culture. What we collected was material that would gradually influence and provide the theoretical basis for activism and further ideas attributed to what was known at that time as a political black or political blackness. In the late 1980s and 90s, we, have, we were also involved, of course, with the struggles of anti-apartheid, uh, uh, with, with what, what the ANC was doing in exile. And to a large extent, to a large extent, um, our place in activism with, let's say, bodies like ANC, which, had, which was performing very well, or, or very centrally in Trafalgar Square, um, became part of our algorithm as artists. It provided, the place of protest provided, in a sense, action-orientated publication of materials. So for instance, a number of artists were involved in producing leaflets, producing posters, producing banners. And artists became as much culture workers as well as providing the contours of image making. One of the things that was really important was a place of photocopying. Artists both produced their own work in photocopiers, using photocopiers, but also produced small press poetry books or helped design some certain things uh, in, in that sphere of production um, for 
people who are working with the subject matters like the Solidarity Network Namibia, for instance, the Swapa Women's Solidarity Campaign between 1981 and 91, or for the Sadhanista Revolution in 1979, a lot of material was inspired by this revolutionary uh, ideas and, and, and activism, but it mobilized the production of political material and a moral solidarity which occurred through protests and groups meeting and working together in London. This printing, the printing of materials for these groups became entangled in what was the post-colonial and the post-independence structure, which also was fought over at the Rushdie affair, or part of the Rushdie affair. How do communities collate? How do they fight against each other? How do they support when there is a, a, an entanglement which is different, difficult to work with? Slide collection, for instance, at Panchayat provided a, a different type of mobility. It allowed us to be used as a resource to operate between and engage between different parts of London, different ideas within Britain, and different art worlds which coexisted. A lot of the work that we did was done uh, through what I would suggest, and can we have the next slide, please, is that it what I would suggest was a different type of British contemporary culture. Here we have an image of uh, Brick Lane. On one side, you have the people who lived there, and the other side, the British National Front, who would often come there with the, their flags and intimidate the people who were working and living in this area. Can I have the next slide, please? So the idea of Panchayat and the Black British uh, um, or the British Black political project was about developing a culture which involved youth, involved technology of the time, and involved activism to broaden the ideas of art itself. Um, and here I'm going to uh, ask you to and wait for a couple of minutes on this next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? I've, I've selected around five quotes from Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, um, Lola Young, Shivanandan, and uh, Tariq Mahmoud, which we can go back to at some point. It talks about the peculiar way it was difficult to pin down this blackness within Britain. Although it was a very positive thing, that Lola Young suggests, it was also about different points and the pluralism that developed within or in, or in, contra in contrast to a nationalism which was hardened and right wing. Um, and that's what I mean is going back to understand where we are now and how, in a sense, racism in that time as Tariq Mahmoud says in the last quote, it's not going to tear this country to piece it, it actually cements it together. Of course, what happened to a large extent was an entangled cultural understanding of political blackness, which for us was very productive. It produced a reevaluation of series of intertextual exhibitions, including one in 1992 called Crossing Black Waters, which was a survey of artists of South Asian descent making work in a post-independent space, uh, to Extreme Unction in 1994, an exhibition, a multimedia exhibition by Asian American artists, including a very young Paul Pfeiffer and Monica Chow. And after the, our presentation at the Havana Biennale, uh, we created an exhibition called uh, Citing Resistance, which then traveled on to the Embassy Cultural House in London, Ontario, during the time of Philip Rushton, um, who, who, who remained a very divisive figure in London, Ontario, and far beyond. What I want to go on to is, uh, actually, can I have the next slide, please? The role, again, of uh, an organization like, like uh, Copy Art was very important in the production of the material I was talking about. Um, the ephemeral material, which now exists as part of the collection donated to the Tate Panchayat, um, it's a place, copy art was a place for artists as well as activism 
to coexist, to produce materials which could be used both in exhibition making, but also in, in, in um, the fight against racism, anti-racist uh, strategies, as well as the fight against uh, colonialism uh, in, in struggles by ANC and other uh, organizations. What I'd like to do possibly is to go on to the next slide now, please. Is this idea of resettling. And um, this, this idea, what is an art to an artist and what is an artist in the artwork is quite interesting. And this work, particular work by Hank Wills Thompson is, is also interesting, What Lives Matters. Um, many artists have worked ceaselessly to bring about new meaning to horizons with a political, social, cultural, economic. And many artists have worked outside of the landscape of the art world. And these new horizons which have been opened up remain their legacies. They've helped us develop certain ideas about events and places and, and occasions, which partly there's also a group of artists now who are making their work um, about the pandemic, for instance, which is going to be really important for both the curatorial research, but also our understanding of what, what is going on for them. But historically, for instance, if we look at the work and the framing possibilities of art, of let's say two artists, Bruce Nauman and Nam Jung Pike, can we have the next slide, please? These two artists and the way that they produce work at a certain time have a salient power in how we are able to use early experiments and how artists trust their own vision to extend the parameters of art as studio practice and within the public realm. I think what happened in the 80s and what is happening at the moment is relevant because it's, it's going to endorse an unconventional approach to contemplate what is art to an artist or what is an artist in an artwork. Many artists are at the moment currently working only in their studios, showing work through their studio portal. Suddenly we have all been humbled by the accessibility of, di of digital presence, as we were humbled by the presence of photocopies in the 80s. Color photocopies when they came became a great revelation for a number of people. So when we find ourselves in online galleries or viewing and assailing exchanges, we are forced in a sense, uh, can I have the next slide please, to make sense of what is going on through whatever appears for us. The recent telematic orchestration uh, and the multiple screening of two key works remains very important within this last year. Um, Hansard Songs by Black Audio Film Collective was shown in its entirety for one week, starting on June the 15th, um, under the sort of auspicious title of Documents, History, Truth. And it coincided with online, online discussions between John O'Comfrey, Tina Kemp, Echo Oshun, and Saidia Hartman as well as Love is a Message, the Message is Death by Arthur Jaffa, which was streamed for 48 hours in the midst of the first wave of the, of the weekend of 26th to 28th of June. Uh, a collaboration between 12 museums and private collections from around the world, world. Both of these things sent a powerful signal as to how to find relevance through telematic orchestrations. As we head towards the end of this presentation, I just want to leave you with both the takeaway, um, which are a series of five questions which have been shared with you, but also to think through about what has happened in the last 20, 30 years. Why is it no longer part of the agenda? How are institutions and cities realize the potency, let's say in this time, of organizing live streaming as a cultural product? What is unique about the set of statements which have been projected or provided for us? And how does that serve the world to be culturally democratic? How does that pro prepare us for a, a sense of resistance? 
and how has it been used to resettle and possibly understand our phobogenic national and racialized cultures which are present in our institutions. So if you turn to the last slide now, please. So the last slide is, is sort of had been important for me to put together only because it talks about the idea that there is still a great amount of protection and the characteristics of protection in, contemporary, in the contemporary art world, which we need to think through. What is, what is the best interest of the art world? And why has it, if, if, if the art world is really interested in serving our, our, us as artists and galleries and curators and collectors, why has this group been out for so long? What, is the, what remains of the failure of that exchange? And how does it shape both policy and our intuitive future? And where is a place of trust? I uh, thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks Shaheen. Um, that's great. We'll just wait a minute to see if anyone's posting any questions um, in the chat. Um, whilst we're waiting to see if anything, I, I um, have a couple of thoughts. Um, I was a really thoughtful articulation and expansive and dense, but I wanted to pick on something that you end with. Maybe we could just go back to the takeaway questions. Um, it's this idea of trust. Mm -hmm. And I liked that you invoked it. Um, at some point I'd spoken about this kind of two dimensionality of our telematic embrace and how it will kind of reconfigure all established conventions. So what, what's your kind of view on, on the role of trust in, in simple terms? How will the trust need to be reestablished between artists and institutions or for that matter, artists and the public, or art and the state, or artists and art even, uh, or, and artists and the public maybe. You know, there's, there's so many parameters at play. So there's sort of, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, trust is I, a big thing, big thing. It's, it's a big thing, it's a big thing. And I think that there's a certain thing which is going on where we're beginning to, as we did in the 80s, believe in the idea of uncovering. Um, going from coloniality to post-coloniality, going from, uh, from, from non-independent to post-independence or independent states. Uh, in a sense, this movement or the move towards something, what is in a sense towards the light of uncovering and coming to a, a sense of the reality of the truth, uh, a better understanding of the world, to put it very simply, uh, requires trust, requires solidarity, requires us to use our knowledge and to be careful and creative and very particular about how we articulate that vision without exclusion, without um, a framework that could stop it very easily. Uh, many people are beginning to argue the fact that what's going on now uh, and the trajectories which we are, to, if we are to think through of what is required for us to change are going to be dropped as easily as they came up. And to a large extent, that is a shift that we believe uh, we need to be very careful of because some, as I suggested, some of the things which were happening in the 80s and 90s, which were you know, anti-racist, anti-sexist, uh, and pro many things which were not on the horizon or part of the agenda were dropped uh, or resolved in other sectors such as diversity and equality. Uh, they were never made to be part of the mainstream. They've never since, since been uh, represented uh, beyond those categorizations and um, holding positions or holding pens. And okay. that's where the trust comes in. 
And we have a question from the audience. How do you believe the shift to an online viewing experience sped up as a result of the pandemic has exposed the problematic nature of many of these large cultural institutions? Do you think the shift to digitization will change these fundamental issues? I think the shift was a necessary methodology to carry on, to be to, to seem to be productive, uh, to seem to be visible, uh, and to take on board both the, the transformational necessity of the time, which is about social distance, it was about closure, it was about uh, cancellation. Uh, and it had to be mediated to a certain extent. But what it ended up also doing is it did expand the audience. I've listened to more people talking about certain subjects now than I have ever had chance to do before. Uh, so the, the shift to the transmission of material can be seen as something which we, ne we need to focus on. Um, but we also need to realize that not everybody has the tools to be part of that conversation. That although it can have a global reach, the global audience is not necessarily global. It's those who have and have not to a certain extent. We still live in a toxic structure uh, uh, of power where to a large extent, visions are not necessarily a shared part of its economy nor is information, nor is knowledge, nor are the new positions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another one. Um, do you have any insights on the history of pedagogy with regard to your third takeaway about the history of art and culture? e.g. high art versus everything else, including cultural spaces, architecture, and interiors, which are historically marginalized, but perhaps even more so in curatorial training. Right. That's a really interesting and uh, cross-disciplinary question. Um, not easy to either think through and, and answer very quickly either. I think to some extent, the, the, the formation of sub-disciplines in the arts or within, within even visual culture, which is predominated by, by uh, the fine arts, fashion, architecture to a certain extent, is uh, to a large extent uh, a constellation which also has decided to present other things outside of it, less so, and less, uh, less, in a sense, uh, made less important by it remaining on the margins in the waiting room of coming in. Um, so for instance, uh, textile is not really part of visual culture, as far as I can see. So it's pedagogic effects uh, a lesser so, its impact is lesser so, unless the contemporary art market decides to bring artists who are providing textile works, which has become recently a, a fad, as well as ceramics, for instance, is another one of those mediums which had been kept outside. And now that Tester Gates and various, and, and Grace and Perry are interested in making ceramic pieces, they become part of the dialogue and, and, and part of the translation of co contemporary ideas. So in, in a provocative way, what we need to think about is that the irony of, of, of inclusion or the irony of diversification of ideas and, 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 and pedagogic spaces is itself a condition which makes uh, specific categories, specific entry points which remain guarded. Um, in actual reality, what we have is that a number of things that we seem to think are important are also part of a certain extent, the lobbying arm of international art fairs, international collectors and uh, collections that drive those, the, the, the driving mechanisms which 
which make ensure that curatorially certain things are never put into their rightful place or honored for what they've done. Um, this is in a sense goes back to the art and the finance sector and the development of the, the art world very much as a kind of neoliberal production of meaning uh, or what is funded and what remains outside of it. Thank you. And I, I think we have time for one last question before we move to our breakout rooms where we'll have discussions and then convene back together again before the conclusion. The question from the audience is, you spoke of the political black. How has the current US Black Lives Matter driven discourse of blackness has impacted the British black discourse? Do you see this as a short-sighted embrace by the UK art institutions? All right, so this is, this is again a very complex, I, I, unfortunately I, I, I've had to, to go through so many different uh, hurdles to get to this, uh, to try and describe the political blackness uh, coherently. And I'm not sure if I've done it justice, but I think what has happened with the protests has profited a large swathe of communities uh, all over the world. It has been used, whether it, if the protests emerge just out of a, a different citizens, smaller cities sometimes in the States. Um, it has infused and it has created a space through which people have got to understand a, the space which has been created for protest by people who had been marginalized for a very, very long time and remain on the edges of those margins just about alive. So that precariousness and the, the, the strength with which uh, the protests have ensued and, and, and infused the world has been very important. It has, of course, take, taken on board and been taken on board in Britain, specifically in its cities, uh, in a way that this is new. And there's been an amnesia about the work which had been gone on beforehand. It has, it has been organized to a certain extent in a way which has been inclusive in terms of uh, both of the agenda of the immediate demands being met or having to be met. Um, but there are problems with any movement because the points of acceleration sometimes steps over things necessarily or unnecessarily by the speed that it sets itself up with. So to a large extent, the political blackness of Britain has been superseded by Black Lives Matter. Um, and only now that I think people are beginning to talk about that kind of localization of knowledge, localization of politics, a micro geography of struggle and the need to look at the foundational structures, which then also the foundational politics, which can be applied to what is going on within the contemporary. Great. Um, thank you. So I think uh, as Judy just, Judith just said, I think we're now ready to go to the breakout rooms. Um, these are self-moderated. I think we're going to have three rooms. Um, you know, please introduce, introduce yourselves to each other. And Shaheen will come into each room um, and, you know, we'll continue this discussion. So I think, um, I don't think, am I missing something, Monica or Judith? We're good? Okay. <laughs> well, we'll see you in a room. <laughs>